Hi, everybody. It's so good to be here. How can we build equality machines? How can we harness artificial intelligence, AI, for good? Now, I want us to talk about AI today, but even more importantly, I want us to talk about how we talk about AI and how we think about AI. And whoever you are, wherever you are, I can bet that you have been thinking about AI and our future. It's unavoidable. AI is personal and pervasive. It's all around us. Sometimes it's literally on us and inside us. It's changing the way that we work, the way we create, the way we play, the way we connect, we engage, the way we go about our well-being, our sports. It even is changing the way we love. So dating apps are powered by machine learning and AI-based algorithms that connect us. Sex tech is moving in light speed, just like health tech and fintech and legal tech and ag tech, you name it, it's here. It's even changing the way that we see ourselves as artists. And I can tell you personally that today, all the images that you're seeing on my presentation are a co-creation between myself and a large language model, generative AI. And for those of you who know me, know that that's quite a feat for me because I've always been something of the black sheep in the family when it comes to art. But look at me leveling the playing field with my friend, the artificial intelligence. So let's start with a show of hands. I want to get kind of a poll of all of you. How many of you own a smartphone? Everybody, right? So we all have AI powered smartphones that we are quite connected to. Now I want to show of hands of how many of you today are wearing a wearable driven AI, a smartwatch. Okay, so about half of you. And finally, I want you to imagine that at the end of this talk, you have to get to the airport and you pull out your smartphone and you pull out your ride sharing app and that ride sharing app suggests to you that the fastest, cheapest way to get to the airport is if you use a robo taxi, an autonomous vehicle, a self-driving car, how many of you are willing to get into that back seat with nobody at the wheel? Okay, so I see a sharp drop, only a few hands. And I'm not surprised, that is actually quite typical because I've been asking this question this past year to audiences around the world, to participants in studies around the world. I actually should mention, you may have seen that I'm wearing two smartwatches. That's part of an experimental study that I'm researching with a collaborative research um, with some psychology uh, professors. And I can just tell you <laughs> one insight is that we do need market competition. We need to experiment with the wearables, with, with all the AI that we have. But it's quite typical that we see this gap between the kinds of applications that have AI in them, the kind of automation that we embrace with excitement, and the ones that we fear, the ones we are hesitant about, we're resistant to see ourselves using or to accept in our society. And as a behavioral researcher, I care very much about that gap, and that gap being based not on irrationalities, but on the right kind of decision-making processes. So as a behavioral researcher who studies tech policy, I think a lot about how our own biases shape the way that we have this dichotomy in our public conversations, in the media, um, also in the laws that we're passing between very utopian, ideas of where our future lies with AI, and then very alarmist, dystopian stories. We're very much in kind of that limbo of a dichotomy. 
And in the behavioral researcher, we have terms for this. We see that in some contexts, we have algorithmic adoration. So we actually have over appreciation of what AI can do for us. But we also have algorithmic aversion. We tend to have um, resistance to AI that can be life-saving, that's consistent, that's accurate, that's really doing wonderful things when we introduce it to different sectors that can really enhance our well-being. So what I want to suggest to you is that if we care about building equality machines, if we care about deploying AI for good, it will be really our mandate, our duty as leaders and um, for ourselves individually to think in a more analytical, rational, empirical, fact-based way about whether we're ready to deploy AI and what kind of AI we want. So I want to suggest to you three mindsets that will be helpful to get us over that hump of AI biases or irrationalities. The first is adopting a comparative mindset. So think about your decision of entering into a robo-taxi. I see this time and again in media debates and reports where there's kind of the salience of a robo-taxi got into a car accident, it's absolutely not safe to use or allow a robo-taxi to be on the road. That, of course, is not the right question to ask. The right question is, is it safer than a human driver? And we all the time need to insist on knowing whether the AI application is outperforming the human decision maker, the human actor, on things we care about. So the same would be true if you're thinking about an AI that is being applied by big tech companies or, or any kind of business to sort through job applicants, a hiring app. We hear a lot about AI bias um, that results in discriminatory uh, sorting. And that, of course, is a fundamental, important challenge that we need to tackle. But the question that we always need to ask is, how does it compare to the status quo, where we know that we ourselves are pervaded by unconscious biases, conscious biases. So all the time keeping that comparative lens in mind between the comparison of the status quo, the human, and the AI. In fact, that comparative lens, that comparative mindset, should also inform us when we're debating whether AI is the black box that we hear about a lot, um, whether we can't understand it. And again, um, social psychology gives us a lot of insight on how we have a tiny algorithm here called uh, the brain that also um, is sometimes difficult to understand. We need to also adopt a comparative lens on the trajectory of improvement. How much can we detect error or correct safety problems that come up, whether we're talking about the human performer and the AI? The second mindset that is absolutely key and fundamental to thinking about equality machines is the access mindset. So sometimes you'll hear uh, these kind of questions about whether an AI is outperforming a human professional. And let's say two, two areas that are near and dear to my heart, access to legal services, access to justice, and access to medicine. You'll hear a comparison of, well, if you take the two best, highest paid, <laughs> mind you, attorneys in the United States, and they give somebody, a client, that is in need of a legal service uh, action, in need of uh, somebody that will represent them in a dispute or a claim, they are still outperforming a large language model, uh, generative AI that is being designed to help people advocate from themselves. Okay, but how many people can afford that kind of service? How many people have access around the world to the best legal professionals and medical professionals? So thinking about scalability, cost, 
access, inclusion is key to understanding whether we are ready to develop, design, and deploy a certain AI application. The third mindset is one of assessing and addressing. We talked about AI readiness, and we have now more tools about thinking about whether an AI is life-saving, whether it will outperform the status quo. Undoubtedly, when we deploy AI in different sectors, there's going to be also changes in our markets, in our society. So take again the example of a self-driving car or truck. In fact, here in California, there was a whole movement to ban self-driving trucks recently. And there was a, a law that was passed, the governor vetoed the law because the movement was not about the safety of the trucks. That actually has been empirically shown at this point that it is a life-saving technology when we're using self-driving trucks. The fear was, and still is, that the truck driver industry will be impacted. And that is absolutely an important focus. It is a key thing that we need to address as a society. We need to think about the wealth cap that will be exacerbated in some instances, mitigated in some ins other instances when we're developing AI. We need to think about the labor market and the environmental impact of applying artificial intelligence. But we should never conflate the two questions of the readiness of the technology on its own performance, on the measures of it performing in a more equal basis, producing results that are more fair, consistent, accurate, life-saving, safe, and their effects, which we absolutely also need to address and be responsible for as a society. Okay, so with these three insights in mind, we have the equality machine mindset. We have comparison, a scale question, and we have to address the consequences and effects, the opportunities and the challenges. So let's think not about a robo-taxi now, but about a robo-physician. Tomorrow you have your annual checkup and you come to the clinic and you're told that your regular physician, now there's an option that somebody something will replace her uh, in this particular screening uh, testing that you have to undergo. I can tell you that last week I actually faced that very same situation. Like millions of other women around the world, I went for my annual mammogram and I actually benefited from a bot radiologist that is now FDA approved to screen images for early detection of breast cancer. And it is outperforming human radiologists. So how do we think about it? We need to analyze the data. We need to think about how many more women at faster, cheaper deployment will enjoy around the world life-saving screening. And we need to think about the future of medicine when we are integrating AI that is life-saving. My father is a medical doctor. He went into medicine to heal. He went into medicine to have the patient-doctor interaction that he saw his father give in clinics that had very low tech. And I can tell you that I've been having these conversations with my dad and with many other doctors. The healthcare profession is experiencing not only a shortage, but a lot of people who are burnt out, they actually have a term for it, paperwork burnout, where they really feel that they are overwhelmed by having to respond to 
emails to inboxes uh, to, to sorting through images and images and having less of that personal interaction with patients. So what does that mean to us? We have an opportunity to think not only about the comparison, but also the interaction. Where are our comparative advantages? So before we end, let me ask you one more time. When, why, and how will we be ready, will you be ready, to give up control over the wheel and go into a self-driving car? Thank you.